Welcome to the One Life Maps podcast. Here's your host and co-author of Listen to My Life, maps for recognizing and responding to God in my story, Sharon Swing. Greetings, it's Sharon Swing. Today, we are talking to Christopher T. Rogers, the author of A Field Guide to Relationships, subtitle Observing Humans in Their Natural Habitat. Hello. Hey, Chris. Uh, Thanks for joining pleasure. us. I'm s- so glad you decided to do this. And I, I, I just love the, uh, the kind of tongue-in-cheek nature of even the, uh, the subtitle, Observing Humans in Their Natural yeah. Habitat. Yeah, I, I, um, I wanted to give good content but I want to be direct. So I was trying to be as playful as I could be. So I'm, if I open up the back end of your book here and it gives the little bio, I just want our, our listeners to know that Christopher T. Rogers trained in marriage and Mm -hmm. family therapy at Richmond graduate university and in Bible and theology at Lee university as a therapist and a freelancer in the helping services for more than 13 years. Chris has helped people from many walks of life to bridge the gap between emotional relational pain and healthy wholeness, both in their relationships and in their spirituality. So Ellen, you're in the Western North Carolina. Mm -hmm. It's one of my favorite places, um, by the way. So thank you so much again for joining us. Now tell us why you wrote this. So um, I'm a, I'm a teacher by nature and I'm very visual And so after years of working with people, what I realized is I've been building this collection of tools and interventions that I've been teaching people. And I'm so visual and I've got a whiteboard uh, in my office. And a lot of times my clients say, oh, now it's getting good when I stand up to my whiteboard. Um, But I started developing these pictures and these ideas. And um, I I actually learned that I love to write. Um, And so I kind of got this idea to kind of collect that all into a book and and give the 10, you know, recurrent themes that I teach people about relationships. And that's the book. And you teach them about relationships in the midst of their own struggles when they come to you, clearly. And so basically, yeah, it's, it's as if these principles and these pictures are helping people to place themselves in the diagrams so that they can kind of unravel their own um, mess in the midst of it. (laughs) So I, I appreciate that. So I want to start with asking you about the three foundational pieces that you have um, just so, so our listeners get this, you've kind of built a pyramid here and at the bottom, at the base, the foundational piece, go ahead and talk about that. Um, the idea is, is the 10 tools I, I want to teach you through this are, um, they're great. What I tell people all the time is they work. I know they work. I live them. I teach them. Um, but they take time. There's no quick fixes here. And ultimately, there are three kind of foundational things you need to kind of understand and put into place in order for the 10 to really work best. Um, and so let's see here, the, the first one, I gotta remember how they're ordered in the book, right? Um, uh, so number one uh, I have here is um, love is a choice, not a feeling. Um, I could go long about that, but the idea is, is a lot of times we confuse the affection that we feel for people, which I love affection, the good feelings we have for people as love. And just trying to set a foundation that love is a choice. It's what you do. Um, It's sacrifice. It's intentionality. um, And not just how you feel. And you really need to know that moving forward because when it comes to successful relationships, it's not always easy uh, and it doesn't always feel good. Number two is this idea of connection, which I up front will tell you I learned from Danny Silk um, and his book, Keep Your Love On. You know, Danny Silk, I would say that I've learned as much from Danny Silk as I did from my um, master's degree. But connection is this idea of both how we pursue relationship and we invite relationship. Um, It's a two-way street. And a lot of times we put something else ahead of connection. So when we put um, being right as first instead of our connection, I can sabotage you feeling safe with me. I can sabotage you wanting to be connected with me. So, uh, and number three is um, 
mistakes happen, get over it. <laughs> um, uh, the idea there is m- momentum is really the name of the game. You can't be perfect. You're not going to be perfect. You need to kind of learn and grow. And that's how this happens over time. Yeah. Cause in relationships, stuff happens that gives you fodder for, uh, for learning Absolutely. more all the time. Yes. Constantly. Yeah. I tell, yes. <laughs> um, I tell people about this, uh, it's not in the book, but I call it the, the, the change curve, which is in essence, we learn in hindsight. We'd like to think that as soon as I learn a new principle, I'm going to immediately going to put it into place. The reality is I learn it and then I watch myself continue to do it wrong. And then I get better and better at implementing it. Right. So, so self-awareness that comes from right. reflection is key to this process. Yeah. As it is within listen to my life as well, because we're, we're looking at past, present, and future, but we got to be able to bring it into the present moment to get that, to get that self-awareness thing going on so we can catch yourself in the act and make a different kind exactly. of choice, right? So love is a choice, not a feeling. That sounds like a, uh, like a pretty good place to start when, especially when we're talking about coming from a Christian perspective, that love is the foundation of, of not only God's relationship with us, but then how we're supposed to be uh, with other people as yes. well. And then that connection, what you're saying is, is all the other ways in which we protect ourselves or try to win or whatever is that uh, if we can get that prioritized first and foremost, yes, I wish everybody knew these two things and I wish I had known them a lot earlier. (laughs) In my, uh, in my book, actually, let me see here in, um, one of the one of the tools is this. Um, there are always thing, two things going on at once. I think it's chapter two, tool number two. Um, there are always two things happening at the same time. There's always the relationship, and then there's also the topic or subject that we're working on at the mm-hmm. same time. That's actually my visual for this idea of connection. What we tend to do is put the subject first ahead of the relationship and then sabotage the connection. So how do you help people to, to change what they say to be able to change that dynamic? Oh, absolutely. That's good. So th- that's, um, that's in there as well. Really, I try to teach just successful communication tools. Um, communication, it, it, that's one of the topics I probably spend the most time talking about or most often we tend to think it's a simple thing and it's actually a bit more complicated we tend to think that the the longer we've been in relationship with somebody or the closer we are the easier communication will be and it's actually often the opposite um, the more history we have the more likely i may misinterpret or be offended by what you say and so i teach them the most simplest two principles are i statements versus you statements um, the way I put it is um, uh, never tell somebody what they did or didn't do or should or shouldn't do. Get really good about talking about you. So the difference being um, I'm hurt instead of you don't care about me. Um, you statements are so much likely to create a reaction, offensiveness, and um, causing somebody to pull away from you or disconnect from you instead of moving towards you. Um, and the other one, which is another very well-known tool, is called the speaker-listener technique, which is basically everybody taking responsibility to make sure that what is being said is what is being heard um, and kind of taking a moment to really check in and say, is this what you mean to say or um, help me understand that better before I just kind of react mm. to it? Yes. So what does family of origin experience have to do with this once we get on late, later on in life and we're responsible for our own relationships, um, maybe in marriage or with our kids or whatever else? So what's what's the family of origin connection? Absolutely. It's, it's kind of fun for me because it's so relevant, but it's easy to kind of joke about or I try to joke about it sometimes with my clients because we, we all know um, or some of us are afraid that you know, our family of origin stuff, our, you know, our quote unquote mommy and daddy struggles or issues, how much they kind of come into the story. But um, basically we learn how to relate by our environment. We learn what is right, what is wrong. How do men interact with women? How do men 
respond or interact or pursue women. We learn that from uh, the people around us. It's we all know or have said, um, uh, "Do what I say, not what I do." We know that doesn't actually work. We we learn very much by by observation or um, culture and behavior is caught, not taught. If that oh, makes any sense. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I I remember a conversation at one point in time I was having with uh, with a client and the idea that they saw themselves repeating patterns that their that they saw their parents engaging in, which was basically to avoid conflict altogether. Because right. they had I mean, who knows why, but she had no idea how to deal with conflict other than to avoid it. That was the only option she right. she saw that she had and saw that 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 pattern went way back and even what remembering some interactions between her grandparents or maybe it was just don't fight in front of the kids who knows what it was right sure. um yeah, yeah, but yeah. It, it and it's not like kids don't see conflict it's just that we want to model for them what it looks like to have conflict well right so Absolutely. this this idea of when people start mapping their life story and start thinking about their relational patterns and and what they're experiencing now and what kind of and, and usually the entry point when someone is working with this stuff in life story work is is that feeling of disconnection that they don't know what to do about. So how right. do you, is is that why people show up on your doorstep? Ah, that's a great question. Um, I think. That is, on a deep level, really what most people are struggling with. That is not what most people understand um, why they came to my doorstep. (laughs) They show up because they're in crisis. They show up because things are falling apart, uh, because their parent, their, sorry, their children are behaving in such a way that they don't know how to manage anymore. Or for me, most often their marriage or their relationships are falling apart. They're unsuccessful. They feel hurt. They feel scared. They feel alone. They feel anger, and they don't know what to do with it. That that's the most reason why people come. We tend to only get help uh, when we're in crisis, which is understandable. It's just not the best time to come. It's hard to change uh, and learn new things when you're in crisis. So, what else are you learning about what people from what people tell you? about their life story leading up to those issues that land them in your office? Oh, that's a good question. I would say the the way I tend to work when I'm talking to somebody and and they're telling me the story or we call it the narrative when they're sharing their narrative, um, the way I kind of work is I'm, I'm listening, observing for how they see themselves in relationship, how they interpret how other people are relating to them. Um, when you're telling a story, you actually reveal so much more about yourself than you realize. And over time, I can kind of build a map for kind of how they see themselves and what they believe to be true about themselves, what they believe to be true about other people, the right ways to communicate, how and when to deal with conflict or why to deal with conflict. Um, And and that's kind of how I approach that beginning process. Mm. Very good. So tell me about a few of the other tools in here that people find most interesting and useful. Oh, that's good. I, I would say the the section that I probably spend a lot of time on, uh, uh, the two bigger ones, I think, as I already said, is communication, um, kind of helping people navigate communication. One of my big sayings is um, uh, what is said is not always what is heard. And trying to break down and make sense of that. Um, another one would be uh, what I call limits, um, or really what a lot of people call boundaries. There's a kind of a silly backstory there, but just briefly, um, after doing a handful of conferences and teaching boundaries, people kept coming to me and saying, "That's not what I thought boundaries were, or that's not what I was taught boundaries are. You should name it something different." So it's just my way of trying to teach people how to manage themselves, that basically limits or boundaries are, it's my job to manage me. I can't manage anybody else. I can't make you be nice. I can't stop you from behaving a certain way. 
But if I learn that it's my job to structure my life and my interactions in such a way that help me manage me so that people are getting the best version of me and that I feel safe, um, that now I'm starting to have good limits. Now I'm starting to have good boundaries. And I would say communication and limits are probably two of the most predominant things that I talk about. Uh, I'll segue in there and say, especially when it comes to things like Christians and their gifting or their ministry and how they operate um, in and around the church and in and around their gifts, because um, there seems to be a big lack of understanding that um, my giftings and what I'm good at or what God has invited me into to participate in uh, is not what makes me special. It's not what makes me unique, not what gives me value. And people tend to give an excess amount of themselves through these gifts and ultimately aren't having good boundaries or good limits. And they give and they give and they give. And the long and the short, Sharon, is that's not a good recipe. And really, they get themselves into some burnout. And that's where things get a little bit complicated. What ideas have they been handed that lead them to, maybe you could call it over-serve? Yeah, that's good. Um, that's a that's a great question. Um, I, I think this is just my theories. Um, my, my thought or observation, especially having been raised in the church all my life as well, is it's not necessarily that they've uh, been taught the wrong things, maybe, as in, um, or they haven't been taught a balance of these things. So we were taught that it's important to give and to serve and And, you know, what would Jesus do and that kind of thing. Um, But what they're not taught is that Jesus um, was not here showing off Jesus. Jesus was here showing off the Father. And so everything that he did was from the Father's strength, from the Father's love, from the Father's compassion. And instead of teaching people that we're supposed to give from the abundance of our walk with the Father, um, people just give. And when you're not giving... The father, you're giving yourself. And that's where we tend to give too much. And I, I think, you know, because churches run on volunteers. I mean, without a big volunteer corps, churches are in trouble. And so sometimes churches can, can you know, do the volunteer call kind of thing, you know, jump in, get involved and everything. Absolutely, and, yeah. And then people, they, they start to find their identity and purpose in it um, in a way that is... Um, that leads them to somehow end up feeling like they need to be the loyal soldier before they're the beloved child of God is what yes. I often observe. Um, Cause we, we, that's right. Yeah. And it's not on purpose. It's no. not intentional, but this is the way we, we tend but to do it's, things. It's definitely one of those things that, that keeps people from being able to serve really joyfully and the limits have mm-hmm. have to do with, uh, like you said, having a way of being and a regular rhythm of of solitude, community, and service that that That's really right. is life giving. And and there's so many people that I've met along the way that they're they're, they're hanging on to this idea of original sin as opposed to original blessing. And there's something about that that keeps them from being able to deal, to, to relate to God as his beloved, as opposed to his soldier um, in a way to, Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. Well, what's your perspective on that? Oh, there's a lot there. These are, this is fun. These are great questions. This is some of my favorite stuff. Um, we're actually kind of working through a, a new curriculum here at our church Um, And it it kind of presents it, I like the way that it's presented um, as kind of looking at it as living from the tree of life versus the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, The tree of life, um, you know, God's original plan, it it really incorporates this idea of you are loved, you are loved as you are, we're in relationship, we're intimate. Um, the, The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is really the idea of Um, It is acceptable for me to play judge and jury over right and wrong, whether I'm acceptable or not acceptable, whether God's happy with me or not happy with me. 
Um, when really the gospel says that's a done deal. It's already signed, sealed, and delivered. You're you're in. Um, and then discipleship and good teaching shows us how to live from acceptance. Shows us how to live from our inheritance. Um, and without that teaching, people, without realizing it, keep trying to earn it and keep trying to deserve it. Um, and it, it doesn't well, that's work. That's how the rest of the world works, is earn it, deserve it. That's right. All of those particular things. So yeah, that that those things run so deep and then they get messed in with the whole uh, difficulty of how we relate to one another as well. Right. So draw the connections between right. between what we just were talking about and just relationships, you know, how we enter in. Sure. Yeah, I don't know if this is a fair place for me to start, Sharon, but the first e- example that comes to my mind is when I've seen some, again, good people. I, I truly love people and I don't play judge. Um, when I see good people, often uh, one scenario is good ladies, good good wives, good moms, um, and they 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 work hard for their family. They they serve and they give and they care. Um, there's been a handful of times where I've seen some ladies, without realizing it, they get they come to me because they're frustrated with their marriage, they're frustrated with their husband, and and the truth is their husband is is failing in some ways, and we've got to work on that as well. But one thing that I've seen is if her her sense of value or worth or place is too largely set in being mom as being caretaker um, without realizing it. Sometimes she's afraid or hesitant to actually share the burden or share the load. And so instead of actually asking for help and inviting her husband into helping, um, she often will just stay frustrated that she feels so unhelped and uncared for. Um, does that mm-hmm. make sense? So, so then it becomes an issue of how do we communicate that, and and keeping Absolutely. the connection above the topic of help. Absolutely. Another one, just to try to balance the equation a little bit, is um, there's an idea from a book by Larry Crabb, originally titled "The Silence of Adam." It's been re re uh, named since then and put back out, but He talks about this uh, struggle we have as men that we are supposed to both exist at home and, so to speak, in the world at the same time. And as men, we tend to put more focus, more energy, more effort, more care, and sometimes more love into the place that we feel more confident. And most commonly, what that means is work in the world gets the best of us and the home gets the the rest of us, so to speak. Um, and again, that's right. an imbalance. That, that also then loops right back into this, how we manage our work, no matter what it is, and what's the, the what the family might be getting as a leftover, um, or the right. the exhaustion, or whatever else is is such that someone really can't emotionally function or connect with themselves, let alone somebody else, at times as that's well. Right. So. Somebody, uh, uh, somebody I've heard before calls it scraps. You, you just, you're just bringing home the and scraps. If you're bringing home the scraps, you, you, you're, you're losing connection. That's right. So, if you're bringing home scraps, there's not really much left to connect mm, with. Yep, that's true. That's true. So, why don't you name the ten tools real quick and give us just a quick rundown? Sure, yeah. Because I want people to have a good idea. Yeah. Uh, um, I'll, I'll say when they purchase this book, not if I'm definitely giving a good plug here because it is, <laughs> it is really a, a very, Absolutely. it's a very simple and incredibly practical read and it's 98 pages and not all the pages right. are filled with words. It, it just That's right. gets On right purpose. down That's to right. the brass tacks of it. And it's got some great reflection questions. So yeah, give us those 10 tools yeah. because remember at the beginning everybody we talked about the base of the pyramid is love is a choice not a feeling and then on top of that both connection and then momentum slash mistakes will happen that it's a process we're not going to get right the first time that's right okay so on top of that we have 10 tools that's right 
Yeah, so I'll, I'll run through those pretty quick and I'll try to very briefly describe them. So tool number one, and, and in my mind, these are kind of intentionally ordered, although it's not 100% necessary. And the book was written so that you don't have to read a whole book or read a whole lot to kind of review these subjects. You know, there are three, four pages max. There's always a picture or a diagram so you can refresh yourself quickly. Uh, tool number one. Each person carries 50-50 responsibility. So the idea there is if, if you think the other person is more responsible for the problems than you, then you tend to wait for them to change or to do something. If you think that the problems are mostly yours, some people get stuck. They feel so burdened by the mess that they've created, then they have trouble finding some momentum. So I'm a big fan of each person always taking their fair share of responsibility because that creates the most potential for them to do the work and create some momentum. Number two, as I said, is there are always two things happening at once, and that's there's always the topic or the situation or the conflict, the issue, but also at the same time you have the relationship. Successful relationships learn how to put the relationship first, which means when you need to put a pause on the topic, on the decision, make sure everybody feels safe, make sure there's connection happening, and then proceed right. forward. Hold on before you Number move. Number three. I, I got to in, in interject on yeah. that one. We're not just talking about marriages here. We're talking about friendships. We're oh, talking no. about work relationships. We're talking about, you know, it's, it's like, Absolutely. yes, I'd, I'd love to take this. I'm an organization development consultant by trade. And, and so to mm -hmm. be able to take this into organizational life and, I always look at work as an opportunity to help people grow up and, uh, yes. and really learn great life skills. And this yes. applies there too. Just saying. Okay. <laughs> that's right. No, and the truth is Sharon that I'm really excited about that because that's where I think I see um, the potential for this and me to start heading in is I would love to start taking this into more corporate settings, into more, church family settings or business settings and, and teaching these things. I've been able to do that a little bit. I would like well, to do I'd, that a I'd lot like more. to see you do that. And I would love to talk to you about that. Yes. So number three, Great. number three, flooding and fleeing. This one's a little complicated and I do teach this and talk about this a whole lot. Basically um, a, a very common and potentially destructive pattern in relationships is how people handle themselves and relate when they're feeling some version or form of insecurity. And typically in a, in a relationship, one person tends to flood and one person tends to flee and both are not very productive. Um, it doesn't matter where it starts, they, they feed off each other. So a flutter increases their emotional expression, trying to make or create a reaction. Sometimes it's um, uh, uh, negative attention is better than no attention kind of thing. There's more to that. But then also the fleer, which is usually the person that avoids conflict, uh, puts a priority on trying to keep the peace, the sense of if you're okay, we're okay. And so instead of being present and engaged, we try to manage the relationship. Uh, number four, limits or boundaries, which I talked about. Um, uh, the first definition I'll give you there is that um, it's what I do or the structures I put in place to help me manage me. And that's what limits are. It's not about managing other people. And then the communication tools, um, communication being uh, what is said is not always heard. And I go through I statements versus you statements and what that can look like and how that affects the relationship. And then the speaker listener tool. Okay. And under communication 101, when you're saying I, instead of you statements, we're talking about starting with I'm feeling. Yes. And, yes. and, uh, yeah. that is just, I was just having a conversation with somebody that had a, a, a boundary related issue at work and regarding gossip. And, and to be able yeah. to say, I'm feeling uncomfortable and, and That's not it. say, I wish you wouldn't gossip or <laughs> just say, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the trick here is that, um, talking about other people feels mm -hmm. safer. Talking about me is vulnerable. And so we tend to, without realizing it, prefer being less vulnerable um, and talking about what other people did or didn't do, and it just isn't really successful right. in communication. Right. So we're on to number six. Yeah. Yes, number six, 
hard, broken, and disconnected. Uh, this one's a little bit complicated, but basically um, through a series of um, unsuccessful communication, hurt, and unresolved issues, our hearts tend to get hard, broken, and we tend to disconnect and kind of what that looks like and how that happens. I developed that when working with relationships that really have been toxic and dysfunctional for a long time and kind of seeing what happens to the human heart after Mm -hmm. that. The next one is identity, role, and value development, which I jokingly call $50,000 worth of uh, uh, childhood development, you know, in a page, basically. It's It's an idea and a diagram to kind of show us how our family environment really shapes us because kids automatically take on the role to make their environment safe and successful. Um, no matter what they, it's so important for the kids that it's safe and predictable. If it's not provided for them, kids automatically take on the job of providing it for themselves. The problem with that is their identity, their relationships, I'm sorry, their identity, their role in relationships and their sense of self are being shaped at the same time. So if it's my job to keep dad happy, um, Maybe I need to do that as a kid, but as I grow older, I tend to believe this is how I have to relate mm-hmm. in relationships. What's really bizarre is we tend to then be attracted to people that need to be managed, and that, that becomes really interesting and complicated. Uh, number eight is love is a mirror. Basically, the idea that um, when we get really good at communication, when we get really good at limits, when we get really good at managing ourselves... Um, this is the best way I'm going to help you see yourself. My primary goal is to not help you see yourself, but when I'm a loving, safe place and I'm not bringing extra baggage, extra conflict, extra issues, extra disrespect to our relationship, and you're the one that's prominent, predominantly still bringing a mess to the, to the relationship, it's a higher chance that you're going to see you um, in the midst of our interaction. Mm-hmm. Then number four, uh, sorry, number nine, what I call one, two, three, four, help. Basically, um, the, the, the closer the relationship, the more we think that by nature of the relationship, we can automatically start helping each other. And it's just not that simple. And so I outline how first you have to feel safe. Second, you need to feel loved. Third, I even need to be open to you. And once I have all those in place, I might actually ask for your help. Whenever we start to help before we've been asked, it usually is offensive and people tend to be more reactive than receiving what you have to say. And then lastly, forgiveness and a little bit about trust. Um, So real quick on that is, um, especially in the church, I think there's a misunderstanding of what forgiveness is and how it works and how trust is a part of that. So my very brief explanation about uh, forgiveness is forgiveness is when I let go of my right or demand that you will serve justice, that you'll be punished, or that um, I'm going to wait until you get it. So um, when I let go of those, that's what forgiveness is. is I'm not no longer going to try to hurt you or make you pay for what you did. I've forgiven you. Um, The complicated thing is that most people think that as soon as you've forgiven me or as soon as I've forgiven you, that trust has been rebuilt. And that's a totally separate issue. Trust is... Yeah, my formula is trust is um, a new standard of beliefs practiced over time. And that's how you build trust over and over and over again. Treat me different. Treat me better. And the longer we do that and the better you get at that, the more I will trust you. So what's the role of a good apology in the midst of that? Oh, yeah, that's that's really good. Um, Wow. A good apology... Um, really should be, I'm only going to talk about me. I'm going to talk about what I did. I'm going to talk about what I did wrong. I'm going to communicate, hopefully express to you how I see or understand that that was wrong. And I'm going to own that. And then I'm going to let it go there. Um, (laughs) Things uh, that are not apologies, sometimes we say things like, I'm sorry you feel that way. Uh, I'm sorry you feel that way is not an apology for what I did. I'm sorry you feel that way is I don't like how you're still responding and I wish you didn't feel that way anymore. <laughs> I'm not um, sorry for what I did. I'm uh, sorry that, uh, that that you feel that way about what I did. 
yeah, exactly. I'm sorry you're still upset. Can we mm -hmm. move on, basically? Um, so, yeah, the place of a good apology. Um, I have a, another thought. I don't think it's in the book here. I, I call it the 1% rule, basically. And this can get a little confusing with some of the other things I've said. But ultimately, when it comes to making amends, when it comes to apologizing, I like to say, even if you think you're only... 1% guilty, you're only 1% at fault, own it like it's 99. Go the extra mile to see where you've made a mistake, where you've been offensive, where you've been unkind, and make a big sort of fuss over that part and let the other person take care of their part. Mm -hmm. So yes, this yeah. has been a conversation with Christopher T. Rogers. And the book, once again, is called A Field Guide to Relationships, subtitled observing humans in their natural habitat. And this book has been called, uh, some, it's been, some very nice things have been said about it on the back cover here. Rogers provides a type of insight and perspective that can be understood and applied by anyone. You feel like you've stumbled upon a treasure trove of relational wisdom and insight. An excellent book that gives relational strategies that actually work. Yes, when I, when this one landed on um, on my table to take a look at for possible uh, inclusion in this podcast. I was excited to read it and then think about all the different ways that I need to um, try some of these strategies again in particular circumstances. And also just really yeah. grateful for slivers of growth that I, that I noticed over time in different ways, but it's a, I think it's a really interesting, challenging book that, uh, that just lays a path forward that I think people can take a hold of and do something with to improve their relationships. So thanks so much. Absolutely. That's, that's my desire. That's my, that's my heart. I, um, I definitely am excited to hear if people uh, use this. So leave some comments for us on the podcast. I'll put a link to where the book can be. In fact, where can the book be, be purchased? <laughs> it's on Amazon. Um, so we've kind of, we've done it through Amazon and you can look up, I think what's easier to do is the title, a field guide to relationships, and it'll pop up for you. You can get it both, uh, in Kindle format or they, they print to order and you get it printed and sent to you. Very good. And if somebody wants to reach you, possibly now, where are you located? If somebody wanted to, to, to go make an appointment with you to see you in your office. Yeah. So, um, I am in the Asheville area in Western North Carolina. Um, you can reach me at Chris Rogers, MFT at gmail.com. Uh, that's Chris Rogers, like marriage family therapist at gmail.com. Um, I, the truth is I do anywhere from three to five sessions online these days. I do a lot of video sessions. I did one today with somebody out in the West coast. And so that's more and more a part of my, uh, my practice as well. That's great. So people anywhere can get a hold of you and, uh, and enter into their story and, and get some help in unraveling it. So well, absolutely everyone, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of the one life maps podcast. We are thrilled that you decided to join us. Please check out the website at onelifemaps.com. Um, rate, review, subscribe, all that stuff to the One Life Maps podcast because it helps uh, spread the word of some of the good things that are happening here. Um, we hope it's served you well. If you have any questions or if you have any suggestions for future episodes, let me know. You can do that by reaching me at service at onelifemaps.com. That's O-N-E-L-I-F-E. M-A-P-S dot com. So you have a wonderful day, everyone. And Chris, thank you again for joining us. My pleasure. Have you thought, I don't know myself anymore? Have you wondered, is there something more? Are you at a crossroads in life and asking, which way will lead me toward expressing more of who I am made to be? Are you looking for a way to understand the restlessness you feel inside? Are you seeking a deeper spiritual life and desire to rediscover who you are through God's eyes? You're ready for the life mapping experience of Listen to My Life. Go to onelifemaps.com to purchase your portfolio of visual life maps. While you're there, check out our upcoming virtual coaching groups, live workshops, 
and options for you to facilitate the Listen to My Life experience with others. That's onelifemaps.com. O-N-E-L-I-F-E-M-A-P-S.com.